Good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Strategic Implementation of a Rapid Molecular Blood Culture Panel for Gram Negative Bacteremia. My name is Sarah and I'll be your X Talks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. This webinar is designed to be interactive and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box. And we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right hand side of your screen. If you require any assistance, please contact me at any time by sending a message using this chat panel. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. Please note that this event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. Live audience members can apply to receive a professional acknowledgement for continuing education or PACE credit issued by the American Society for Clinical Laboratory Science through our exit survey at the end of today's session. Certificates for approved applications will be emailed by November 8th. At this point, I'd like to thank Luminex, who developed the content for this presentation. At Luminex, their mission is to empower labs to obtain reliable, timely, and actionable answers, ultimately advancing health. They offer a wide range of solutions applicable in diverse markets, including clinical diagnostics, pharmaceutical drug discovery, biomedical research, genomic and proteomic research, and food safety. They accelerate reliable answers while simplifying complexity and delivering certainty with a seamless experience. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Dr. Maggie Box has directed the Antimicrobial Stewardship Program at Scripps Memorial Hospital in La Jolla, California for the past nine years. She received her PA, or sorry, PharmD from the University of Nebraska in 2006 and completed her acute care residency at the Phoenix VA Medical Center in 2007 and her infectious diseases specialty residency at the University of California, San Diego in 2008. Our second speaker for today, Dr. Kimberly Clays, is the antimicrobial stewardship pharmacist and faculty member at University of Maryland Medical Center. She completed her PharmD at Wayne State University, Eugene Applebaum College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences in Detroit, Michigan. She then completed her pharmacy practice residency at the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Pharmacy and University of, of Illinois at Chicago Hospital and Health Sciences System. After residency, she completed a two-year infectious diseases pharmacotherapy and health outcomes fellowship at the Anti-Infective Research Laboratory at Wayne State University, as well as a graduate certificate in public health from Wayne State University School of Medicine. So without further ado, I'd like to pass control of the presentation over to our first speaker for today. And uh, Dr. Kim Clays, you may start your presentation whenever you're ready. Okay, do you see my title screen? Yep, it looks good. Okay. So briefly, I'm going to go over the objectives for today, review the available literature on the benefits of rapid diagnostics uh, with active antimicrobial stewardship involvement. Obviously, we're going to be focusing on gram negatives today. And then for the majority of the talk, we're going to describe methods to implement stewardship-driven RDT interventions with the Vera gene blood culture gram negative test. So briefly, um, since today we're focusing on rapid diagnostics and bloodstream infections, I want to show some of the data we have supporting the use and how it improves patient outcomes. Last year, there was a meta-analysis published in CID that showed that with the use of rapid diagnostic testings, patient outcomes could significantly improve, in particular have a decrease in overall mortality. But what's really interesting and what's really important for us today is that when, when those studies were stratified by presence or absence of active antimicrobial stewardship involvement, it was really the studies that showed active antimicrobial stewardship involvement in intervention that drove that significant improvement in patient outcomes. <clears throat> 
So this has become a niche for stewardship programs to try and improve patient care in their own site. And unfortunately, as I'm sure most of you are aware, most of the data is focused on gram-positive bloodstream infections, and we've had limited guidance when it comes to gram-negatives. Now, everyone should be fairly familiar with the Varagene blood culture gram negative, but I'm briefly going to go over it today. Uh, for today. It's an automated multiplex nucleic acid test. It identifies eight target organisms at the genus or species level, as well as six key resistant determinants, uh, which are enzymes causing either extended spectrum beta-lactamase resistance or carbapenem resistance. Between the organisms it covers and the resistance mechanisms it covers, it covers about 90% of the gram-negative bloodstream infections you're likely to see at your healthcare facility. Now, there's limited real-world data for varigine blood culture gram-negative in terms of decreasing time to optimal therapy, but in 2015, when we started using the varigine blood culture gram-negative, or I'm just going to call it varigine from now on, we did a theoretical assessment of the potential time to effective and optimal therapy, and we looked at over 130 instances of uh, first first bacteremia with monomicrobial gram negative. And our group found, as you've seen with previous literature, an overall high sensitivity and specificity of the test and a significant decreased time to either effective antibiotics by a change of about four hours or time to optimal antibiotics up to 18 hours difference. So theoretically, we have the opportunity when acting upon these results in a timely fashion to significantly decrease the time to effective and optimal therapy. Now, moving away from theoretical, we do have a real-world publication from the Cleveland Health System. They published their experience with Varagene and active stewardship intervention. Um, their intervention consisted of the development of a treatment algorithm combined with real-time intervention. So their real-time intervention used uh, clinical decision support software so that the PharmDs from the stewardship program would automatically be notified of the Varagene result during regular working hours. And through that notification, their pharmacists were able to make timely recommendations to the primary care providers based on the results of the Varagene. So with this implementation, they did a pre-post or quasi-experimental study with the primary objective at looking at time to antibiotic switch. And we can see they had a large sample size, 877 patients. Overall proportion of patients that were switched pre and post wasn't significantly different, 77% versus 78.6%. And patient outcomes such as in hospital mortality weren't significantly different, but what was significantly different was the time to switch. And that significantly decreased in the uh, post-implementation varigine group. And we see here that uh, time to any antibiotic switch decreased by a median of 15.5 hours. Time to appropriate escalation de uh, decreased by 13 hours. In the subgroup of patients where in patients weren't originally on effective therapy, the time to effective therapy de decreased by 18.7 hours. We can also see, unfortunately, there was only a modest change in time to antibiotic de-escalation, only 4.5 hours. So even though all of these are significant, arguably 4.5 hours wasn't a clinically meaningful decrease. This might be due to hesitancy to de-escalate, and this is uh, can be caused by a couple reasons, really. So as you're probably all familiar, gram negatives causing bloodstream infections are generally more diverse than those we see from gram positives causing bloodstream infections. Additionally, although Varagene identifies a large number of genetic resistant determinants and a uh, majority of causative organisms, we have other resistant mechanisms that could be at play, such as porn channels and efflux pumps. So there's an extremely complex um, clinical decision-making process that has to go on in order to decide to de-escalate antibiotic therapy. And even though Varagene provides useful information hours to days sooner, some physicians are hesitant due to the incomplete data. So one of the things that we've worked on uh, is to and that you'll probably need to work on your own institutions is to garner international institutional excuse me institutional support and increased confidence in decision making based off this data especially when it relates to de-escalation and to do that you really need to know your institution specific data so for the rest of the talk from my end i'm going to be talking about data that's come out of my facility university of maryland medical system and medical center University Medical Center is the largest hospital within our system. It's got a central micro lab, an on-site processing 24-7. It is an 800-bed tertiary care academic medical facility. It has a large comprehensive cancer center, multiple 
immunocompromised hosts through different types of solid organ transplants. We have a level one shock trauma center. And we're fairly unique in the fact that we have six ID consult services and one primary ID team. So our hospital tends to be pretty saturated with ID clinicians. Um, and we're also in downtown Baltimore, so we're in a large urban area, and we do see a significant amount of both gram positive and gram negative resistance. So brief overview of the kind of facility I'm coming from. To give you an idea, we see about 350 to 400 gram negative bloodstream infections annually. We started using the Veragene system, both the gram positive and the gram negative, back in September of 2015. And although the gram positive treatment algorithm was quickly approved and implemented, the gram negative kind of sat in limbo as our team wasn't exactly sure what to do with it. In fact, we had an algorithm for both the gram positive and the gram negative, but the gram negative kind of just sat in a file folder for a while. There was concerns in our uh, antimicrobial subcommittee at University of Maryland about how to actually implement this. Um, again, what, because of the complexity of, of the gram-negative infections, as well as some concerns about polymicrobial infections. So with polymicrobial infections, there is there was concern about missing one of the organisms. It could be either below the limit of detection or potentially not being tested based on the workings of the microbiology lab. For instance, if a set of blood cultures comes down, both gram stains or a gram negative rod, only one of those bottles will be tested. But theoretically, there is a chance that the other bottle had a different organism in it. So those were concerns brought, to our group, brought from our group to us when we're trying to implement the gram negative panel. What I ended up doing was working with our colleagues at the Detroit Medical Center to review over a thousand sets of gram negative blood cultures to help determine the potential clinical impact of these missed organisms. So polymicrobial gram-negative infections were fairly rare, as was the potential for missed organisms. And assuming patients were started on a workhorse anti-pseudomonal, and we had 100% adherence of aerogene results, less than 2% would have resulted in a potentially inappropriate de-escalation. So this outcome was extremely rare, and we also noted to our group that it didn't account for any impact of clinical judgment, and we assumed that patients were on an appropriate agent at the time of the result, which we know is not always the case. So with this information, we were able to put to rest some of our ID group's initial concerns and hesitancy. So then we moved on to trying to figure out how best we wanted to implement the Veragene. So for today, I'm going to talk about our work looking at developing an antibiotic treatment algorithm, as well as a Veragene-specific antibiogram. Before I go on into depth about the algorithm, I just wanted to have a little disclaimer slide about our algorithm. It is going to be on the next slide. and is also recently published in Open Form and Infectious Diseases. It is institution specific. It combines evidence-based practice with our own resistance patterns based on our antibiograms. It's not meant to be used outside UMMC without validation. And of course, the algorithm should never supersede clinical judgment. So this is the overall algorithm, as you see. Um, I mentioned before, we started in 2015. It's been since updated based on different data for, say, resistance mechanisms. Recommendations are first divided by presence or absence of resistance, then the type of organism, and then, if needed, by location of care. So I'm going to go into depth on this algorithm a bit more in the next couple slides. So we see with the resistance mechanisms, it's largely based on in vitro peer review data, um, because luckily we don't see a lot of these resistant mechanisms commonly, or sometimes in the case of metal beta lactamases at all. And like I said, this is, has been updated. We update it periodically based on peer-reviewed literature. For, for instance, for OXA48 and Terabacteriaceae, we separated out compared to Acineobacter and recommended Cazavi. For NDMs, we switched out colistin and tigacycline for uh, Cazavi to have the as avibactam as trianam combination in there. So those are certain things we had to do based on in vitro peer-reviewed data because we just don't have a lot of experience with them. We do, however, have su sufficient data to try and make recommendations based off the gram negatives that don't have resistant determinants present. So we largely base these recommendations off of our in uh, institutional antibiograms, either the overall antibiogram or our site-specific antibiograms. So for instance, looking at E. coli and CLEB, it's stratified by non-ICU versus ICU. And the rec overall recommendations were based on wanting to have at least 88% susceptible by our antibiogram. And why 88%? The acceptability cutoff was determined based on our pseudomonas susceptibilities to piptazo, which is our workhorse anti-pseudomonal. So basically, our antibiogram said that pseudomonas was susceptible 88% of the time. So we use that as our cut point. We could have used 90% to be 
kind of less arbitrary, but we used 88%. The cut point you decide on really depends on your own institutional preferences. But that was our first decision. And then we also looked at unit-specific antibiograms. So for instance, in the ICU, we saw unacceptably high rates of ceftriaxone resistance. Um, so we decided not to go with ceftriaxone for ICU patients when, a, a bit, when excuse me, when CTXM or another resistant determinant wasn't present. So this is the overall workings of the algorithm and how it's put together. We presented this algorithm to our antimicrobial subcommittee for approval, but they wanted to actually go through a pretty thorough validation of it. And I'm going to just go through the steps of what I ended up doing to garner their support of the algorithm and eventually get it approved at our institution. So the first part of the algorithm validation was I looked at the overall organisms that were identified, and I just looked at the general sensitivity and specificity, which is very similar to what we see from previous literature, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. Then I ended up stratifying by presence or absence of resistance and then applying the algorithm recommendations to the organisms. So for 322 organisms, I looked at whether or not the recommendation by the antibiogram would have been appropriate in terms of in vitro susceptibility, and I compared that to our workhorse anti-pseudomonal gram-negative gram agent, Piptazo. So focusing on the box that's highlighted, because it's got the most information, E. coli and CLEB, if we look at patients who weren't in the ICU, we only had uh, two organisms that were ceftriaxone resistant if CTXM or KPCs were negative. So that was compared to our workhorse antipsychomonal, where six organisms were either intermediate or resistant. So we found that in the absence of resistant determinants, ceftriaxone would have actually been a better recommendation than Piptazo based on our or individual organisms in that data set. But like I said, this is compelling information, but my group still wanted more data. So what I ended up doing next is actually looking at the individual patient level. They were concerned that we were doing all these theoretical assessments, but we weren't looking at what patients were actually receiving and whether or not we were accounting for other sources of infection and so on. So we took those, pa we, those organisms and looked back at the actual patients they came from. We ended up including 188 patients in our study sample. We found that almost half of them were in the ICU. 85.8% had an ID consult at the time of Veragene. Not surprisingly, the most common sources were genital urinary and gastrointestinal. And not listed here, but the most common cause was E. coli and CLEB. And we had a spattering of resistant determinants such as CTXM, KPC, and OXA. What we ended up doing was looking at what antibiotics the patients were actually on at the time of the Veragene result and comparing them to our Veragene recommendations. So we looked at Veragene versus what we called standard care antibiotics. For 144 of those 188 cases, we were able to assess the appropriateness of the antibiotics, appropriate being in vitro susceptible, not overly broad, and accounting for potential other sites of infection as well as other causative organisms. We did this as a blinded review between myself and my colleague, who's also a stewardship pharmacist here at University of Maryland. And then if there was a low level of agreement, we would adjudicate. But overall, we found that using the algorithm, we would have had a significant improvement in recommendations and appropriateness of antibiotics from 78.1% to 88.4%. And this is, again, based off of just using the algorithm, but we're likely to even see better results with actual clinical judgment in real time at the, site, at the bedside. From a stewardship perspective, certain aspects kind of came out in the wash. Um, we see that stewardship treatment algorithm would have resulted in 14.4% appropriate de-escalation, but then 4.48% inappropriate de-escalation, 5.3% appropriate escalation, but then 16% unnecessary escalation. And again, we still didn't account for clinical judgment and taking into consideration such things as MDRO history and length of stay before gram-negative BSI onset. So certain things like that could potentially improve the overall use of the algorithm. So after we presented this data to our subcommittee, they felt a lot better about actually approving the algorithm. The algorithm ended up getting approved, it was put in our institutional guidelines, and then it went on to actually develop a pathway. So we don't have a real-time clinical decision support to automatically notify us of results, so we worked with our uh, colleagues both in the clinical micro lab as well as our uh, consult teams to try to figure out how to triage the results as best as possible. Basically, what we decided to do is the clinical micro lab would call the primary team with the results as they always did. 
would then also make a special call to our general ID consult service if it was a difficult to treat organism such as Pseudomonas, Asneobacter, or any organism that had a resistant determinant. The ID fellow 24-7 could receive this page. If it was during regular working hours, they could triage it to one of the other ID services if they were already taking care of that patient, or they could make a recommendation as needed. And then the primary team obviously could accept or reject the general ID consult fellow's recommendation. So this accounts for about 40 to 60 organisms a year, the Pseudomonas asneobacter and resistant determinants. But like I said, we have well over 300 gram-native bacteremias a year. To help with potential de-escalation and review of non-resistant organisms, our antimicrobial stewardship pharmacists run a daily reporting workbench report in EPIC. And then we look at all the gram-negative bloodstream infections in our institution and recommend de-escalation when appropriate. And then we document our interventions. So that's the current pathway that we have in process here at University of Maryland. We are in the process of evaluating it. We're looking at before Veragene, Veragene without this pathway, and then Veragene with this pathway to hopefully see an improvement in timing of antibiotics that are appropriate, as well as hopefully patient outcomes. What we also did um, with our colleagues at Detroit was kind of decide, look at whether or not we could develop an antibiogram. So we looked at the Veragene results and we compared it to conventional microbiology. We obviously looked at sensitivity and specificity, as you've seen before in many publications, but we also want to look at the positive and negative predictability based on the presence or absence of those resistant determinants, key antibiotics. So we're looking at certain bug-drug combinations with or without resistant determinants. And then we worked to develop an antibiogram based off this information. We did that for both Detroit as well as University of Maryland. What we ended up doing was we broke down by organism, target drug and resistant marker. So there's a lot going on in this slide, but I just kind of, again, want to highlight what's going on with E. coli because it had the largest numbers. So with E. coli, we looked at how often they were phenotypically ceftriaxone resistant by our standard microbiology techniques, and then how often CTXM was identified. So we found that in 93% of the cases, if ceftriaxone resistance was present, CTXM was present. So we found a high sensitivity and positive a negative predictability. So the negative predictability, meaning that if CTXM is not present, we feel very comfortable that we can de-escalate the ceftriaxone because it's very unlikely that ceftriaxone resistance will be present. So this kind of gives the same information as what we use to validate the algorithm, just presented in a different way. We also looked at, um, like I said, the antibiogram and trying to develop an antibiogram. So this is what we did for University of Maryland Medical Center. Similarly, we broke it down by CTXM positive negative for E. coli Cleb or even Enterobacter for our case. And then we looked at susceptibility for our formulary antimicrobials. So very much similar to a regular antibiogram, except instead of just breaking it down by organisms, we also broke it down by presence or absence of resistant determinant. So this has a few limitations and drawbacks, the biggest one being that the sample sizes tend to be very small. A major challenge is that with CLSI recommendations, you need at least 30 isolates to draw inferences, uh, which can be incredibly difficult when you're looking at some of your resistant determinants, such as OXAs or KBCs. But overall, we were able to develop an antibiogram that could potentially be used in clinical practice to help guide therapy in a similar way to our algorithm. So the, the algorithm, we saw that for all organisms except Pseudomonas, susceptibility was predicted by the presence or absence of the resi resistant determinant. The negative predictive value was um, greater than 90% for these target antibiotic combinations. We were able to develop these institution-specific antibiograms. But we did have limitations based on sample sizes, based on the CLSI recommendations for antibiograms. We ended up going with the algorithm instead of the antibiogram because it's more intuitive for clinicians that aren't used to reading antibiograms. So it has a broader scope from that perspective and it was just easier to get approved from our antimicrobial subcommittee. But those are two ways that we at University of Maryland looked at implementing and integrating Veragene blood culture gram negative. And that kind of concludes my section of the talk and I'll hand it on over. Okay, uh, this is Maggie Box talking. Um, I am the infectious disease pharmacist at Scripps Memorial Hospital in La Jolla, California. To provide you a little bit of background about Scripps, we are a five hospital system in San Diego, California. Um, our five sites see a variety of different patients. Two of our sites are major trauma centers. 
One of our site is the Center for Major Cardiovascular Surgery and is a stroke center. Um, we have one hospital that performs transplants and we do a lot of mother baby um, uh, care as well. So we are a very comprehensive healthcare system in San Diego, California. Between our five hospitals, we do have each hospital with an ID pharmacist and an ID physician who ser serves as the antibiotic stewardship chair. We do have a centralized antibiotic stewardship uh, committee that all five sites participate from. And our microbiology is performed mainly at a central microbiology laboratory that's off-site from all the five different hospitals. Um, but this is the location of where our most skilled microbiology techs uh, work out of. And each site has some capability of doing their own micro before it is shipped off to our central micro laboratory. I wanted to share with you how our health system went about getting Veragene gram-negative on board. So at this point, back in 2014, we had been on board with Veragene gram-positive for a little over a year, and we did a pilot with this and actually saw very promising outcomes with our Veragene gram-positive work. We wanted to expand to include the Veragene gram-negative panel when it was FDA approved. And in order to make our case, um, we went to look at our incidence of ESBL E. coli bacteremias and how long patients were on ineffective antibiotics. At our southern hospitals, especially that are closer to the border with Mexico, um, we had a much higher incidence of ESBL producing E. coli. The rate was approaching 20%. And we looked at a year's worth of data for patients that had ESBL bacteremia and found that almost all of these patients, 87%, received initial ineffective antibiotic therapy. And the ones that did receive effective antibiotics, it was likely because they had a history of an ESBL that was documented. And when we looked at how long patients remained on inappropriate antibiotics, this averaged out for 48 hours. And some patients were on ineffective antibiotics for over 120 hours. This data was pretty compelling um, to our administration, and we were successful in convincing them to bring Veragene gram-negative on board based on this. We also looked at the average amount of time until infection control was notified that the patient was infected with a multidrug-resistant organism to get the patient placed on proper contact isolation, and we found that the patients were not on the proper contact isolation for about 37 hours. So this is the data that we use to help make our case for um, why we think Veragene gram-negative would benefit our patients here at Scripps. I want to describe for you the workflow between our laboratory um, nurses, pharmacists, and physicians. On top here is the conventional workflow uh, prior to implementation of Veragene. At time zero here is when the blood culture is drawn and incubated. When it turns positive, it's then gram stained. And then this is a critical result that the laboratory tech calls to the patient's nurse on the floor. And then the nurse has to notify the physician of the critical result. That is the only notification that was provided to the physician about the results of their blood culture was just the gram stain. It was then the physician's responsibility to go back and look for the identification sensitivities, which typically was put in the medical record about 48 hours after the gram stain. When we implemented Veragene, the change we made to our workflow was at the point here. Um, the gram stain was still called to the nurse who then had to notify the physician it was a critical result. And then the blood culture was set on Veragene. And with the Veragene result, we then had our laboratory technician contact the pharmacist. Um, and then the pharmacist would notify the physician of the result and make appropriate recommendations for antibiotic therapy if it was needed. Some changes we made when we expanded rapid diagnostics from gram positives to include gram negatives is initially we had one, uh, we had our central, um, we had our processors located at our central microbiology lab where the skilled microbiologists did this. However, we knew when we expanded the volume that this was going to be too much workflow and that each site really needed to have its own processor. So we did move processors out to each site and our central microbiology staff came out and performed training for our on-site lab technicians. And then in addition, since we were able to move it on-site and there was personnel in the lab 24-7, whereas the micro lab did not have um, staff on certain hours overnight, we were able to perform our testing 24-7. And another change we made from our initial gram-positive pilot was the notification of pharmacists from the lab technicians. 
Um, initially, we started out by having lab technicians call the pharmacist with a result, which ended up being um, a, a pretty cumbersome task. And so we moved to a system where lab was able to notify the pharmacist via email, which was a much smoother communication process for the lab and the pharmacist as well. The pharmacist notified the physician um, for critical bug drug mismatches 24 seven. We trained all of our clinical pharmacists on staff to be able to interpret the varigine gram negative results and identify if the patient was on the correct antibiotics. So overnight, if it was a bug drug mismatch, the uh, on-call on hospitalist or intensivist was paged and started on appropriate antibiotics. And then all other results were notified in real time from approximately 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. when the attending physician was on site and um, the physician who was more familiar with the patient would be comfortable making um, antibiotic changes. In preparation for go live of Varagene gram negative, our antibiotic stewardship committee reviewed our local antibiograms to determine the drug of choice for our Varagene gram negative targets. And what we did was we, we uh, separated out our ESBL producing E. coli and Klebsiella and did two separate antibiograms and looked at our treatment of choice for our ESBL producers versus our non-ESBL producers. And here was the data um, that we utilized when selecting our antibiotics um, for E. coli and Klebsiella that were found to be non-ESBL producers. We did find that ceftriaxone was susceptible to um, a high percentage of these isolates 97 and 98%. And really this was just as susceptible as more broad spectrum anti-pseudomonal agents such as piperacillin tazobactam or ceftazidime. And so we also thought that in addition to getting patients with ESBL producing bacteremia on effective antibiotics earlier, that if we identify the patient is not infected with an MDRO enteric, this may be a potential for us to decrease some unnecessary broad spectrum anti pseudomonal utilization. We did a lot of education with our pharmacists, physicians, and other clinicians prior to go live of Varagene gram negative. And this document just shows you some of the materials that we developed for education. We listed out each target that was um, detected by Varagene and listed out the drug of choice and what the susceptibility was according to our antibiogram. And we also provided recommendations for therapy to escalate to if the patient had a, a drug resistance marker detected. All of these education materials were posted on our antibiotic stewardship website. So this was available for pharmacists and physicians at all times. So um, the staff pharmacists who were in charge of relaying the Varagene results to the physicians could access this at all times. And here is another example of the algorithm that was posted on our website to try and make things very clear for our staff pharmacists on what the drug of choice would be based on the Varagene target and if a resistance marker was present or absent. Each pharmacist was required to undergo a one-hour education uh, session that was led by an ID pharmacist at each site, and um, they had to do validation with the ID pharmacist as well that they could interpret the results and apply this correctly to a clinical patient scenario. We were ready to go live with Varagene Gram Negative, and we wanted to develop two performance improvement projects to um, present to our administration what kind of outcomes we would get in result from implementing Varagene Gram Negative with real-time antibiotic stewardship intervention. So the first project, we wanted to look at our patients with MDRO bacteremia, since this was the data that really helped us convince administration the need for implementing Varagene gram negative. And we wanted to look at the improvement of time to effective antibiotic therapy for these patients. And then we also wanted to conduct another project looking at patients that were infected with a non-multidrug resistant bacteremia and see if there was any potential for Varagene gram negative to help us reduce our broad spectrum anti-pseudomonal antibiotics. For our first study, um, looking at the outcomes of MDRO bacteremia, this was a pre and post analysis before and after implementation of Varagene gram negative. We looked at all adult patients with CTXM positive E. coli detected by Varagene, and prior to that, we looked at all patients that had an ESBL producing bacteria and compared the time to effective antibiotic therapy between these two groups. For secondary outcomes, we also looked at the overall and ICU length of stay and 30-day mortality. This data is still preliminary. We haven't had um, it completed yet, but we um, 
with only 24 patients in the intervention group compared to 86 in our pre-intervention group, with Veragene gram negative and rapid intervention, we were able to decrease our time to effective antibiotics from 48 hours prior to Veragene down to 18 hours with Veragene. And this was a statistically significant value. As far as our secondary outcomes related to mortality and length of stay, we haven't seen any significant changes yet with our preliminary data, um, but this is something that we're going to um, analyze again once we have all the data collected for this outcome. Our second uh, project that we looked at with the implementation of Veragene gram negative was if Veragene can help decrease broad spectrum antibiotic use. And just to walk you through a typical scenario where we thought this might have the potential would be a 75-year-old male admitted for cholecystitis, started on empiric piperacillin tazobactam therapy and was found to be bacteremic with an E. coli. Typically after two to three days when the cultures have finalized and the sensitivities are available, the antibiotics can then be de-escalated. And this um, diagram kind of walks you through the workflow on where we wondered if we could get antibiotics de-escalated sooner. So again, here on the top line is the timeline of, it, of um, the bacteria in the blood culture. So at time zero, the blood culture is drawn, it's turned positive, and then once the gram stain is performed, we know the pathogen group, it then has to be subcultured and can be ID'd. And then once sensitivity testing is back, we have the antibiotic sensitivities available and empiric therapy with piperacil and tazobactam can then be de-escalated if um, it's a sensitive organism. So we were wondering when we implement Veragene gram negative, and we know at this point we'll have the identification of the organism earlier on, and we know if it contains a resistance gene or not, we wanted to see if we could get patients de-escalated sooner. So the patient would be on empiric broad spectrum therapy for a shorter amount of time, and then antibiotics de-escalated with the Veragene result. Our study design for this was a pre-post analysis that was done one year before and after implementation of Veragene gram negative. We looked at patients that were bacteremic within 48 hours of admission, and we looked at our enterics where we, we were able to make empiric antibiotic recommendations with a non-antipseudomonal antibiotic. Based on our antibiogram, this included patients infected with E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Klebsiella oxytoca, and proteus species, where no resistance markers were detected by Veragene. We excluded patients if they had a mixed bloodstream infection, if they had another concomitant infection with Pseudomonas or another MDRO where you would need broad spectrum antibiotics, those patients who had antibiotics withheld due to comfort care goals, or if the bacteremia was identified prior to admission. The primary endpoint of the study was to measure antibiotic consumption determined as anti-pseudomonal versus non-anti-pseudomonal antibiotics, measured as days of therapy per patient day and we measured this within the first five days of hospitalization. Secondary outcomes we looked at were length of stay, ICU length of stay, and mortality. This is the demographics of our groups. We did have um, a lot of patients in each group. The pre-intervention group had 512 patients and the intervention group had 539. So we were able to collect a lot of data over two years with this project. Patients were similar in terms of age, sex, Charlton comorbidity index, the admitting floor, the organisms that were identified between E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Proteus and Klebsiella oxytoca, as well as antibiotic allergies. The one difference that I wanna point out in the demographics that I'll talk about shortly is there were a higher percent of patients in our pre-intervention group that had an ICU stay versus our intervention group. Our primary endpoint for the study was to look at the antibiotic con consumption on anti-pseudomonal versus non-anti-pseudomonal therapy. Overall, we found a statistically significant decrease in our anti-pseudomonal or broad spectrum antibiotic consumption and an increase in our non-anti-pseudomonal or our less broad spectrum antibiotic consumption. When looking at our ICU cases only, which ended up being 131 patients in the pre-intervention group and 106 in the intervention group, this trend remains statistically significant. And we'll point out too that we looked at the total days of therapy per patient day between both groups, 
for our overall groups, this was one, and for our ICU patients, you can see this was higher than one. So this indicates that our ICU patients did receive more combination therapy than our overall patient population. This pie graph gives a better visual of our primary endpoint. So the, the anti-pseudomonal antibiotics represented by AP are in the dark blue, and the non-anti-pseudomonal antibiotics are light blue. And overall, this visually helps you see that there is a shift in the antibiotic consumption to using less broad-spectrum anti-pseudomonal antibiotics and using more non-anti-pseudomonal antibiotics. This is the same data just with our ICU subset of patients, and we still did see that trend that we're able to shift antibiotic com consumption in this population to use less anti-pseudomonal antibiotics. So as I mentioned before, there were more ICU patients in the pre-intervention group um, compared to the intervention group. So it is possible that there was more broad spectrum antibiotics use in this group because it was a sicker population. To assess for this, we did a sub-analysis and looked at patients started on empiric antibiotic, on empiric anti-pseudomonal therapy. So you can see there were more patients in the pre-intervention group started on empiric anti-pseudomonal therapy compared to the intervention group. However, our consumption of antibiotic um, did remain significant that we used less broad-spectrum anti-pseudomonals in the patient population. And so this data indicates that our intervention still remains significant um, even among the patients that were started on broad spectrum anti-pseudomonal therapy. We also think that it's possible that less empiric anti-pseudomonal therapy was prescribed in the intervention group due to the fact that providers became more familiar and comfortable with the technology. And as they became more aware of the antibiotic recommendations, they prescribed less anti-pseudomonal antibiotics. Our secondary endpoints are shown in this table here. We didn't see any statistically significant differences in length of stay, ICU length of stay, or mortality. When looking at costs, the overall total direct variable costs for the hospitalization were not significant between groups. However, we did see a significant decrease in pharmacy direct variable costs and also a significant decrease in our total antibiotic costs in the intervention group compared to the pre-intervention group. We also worked with our pharmacy financial analysis um, when we were presenting this data to our administration to try and um, show a, a, the cost benefit overall um, of Veragene technology. And we actually found that when we um, removed outliers from this population, when we removed patients that had a length of stay over three standard deviations from the mean, which probably represented patients who were hospitalized due to other complications or perhaps didn't have a good um, place to discharge to, when we excluded these outliers, our hospital costs were $750 less per patient in the Veragene group. And when we, analyze, when we annualize this group to our entire year's worth of patients with gram-negative bacteremia, this was a, a savings of $650,000 per year. There were the safety concerns that we wanted to um, analyze, and Kim touched on this quite a bit during her presentation, but the, the big concern is what if the resistance marker is present that isn't detected by the Veragene BCGN? So in a nutshell, what if our empiric antibiotic recommendations don't cover the pathogen that's not identified? So what if we have a pathogen that's an ESBL that's not a CTXM type? And we did look at this data and um, analyzed our empiric recommendations, and we did find that still with our um, year's worth of data that our empiric drug recommendations were effective in 99% of patients with E. coli, 100% of patients with Klebsiella bacteremia, and 97% of patients with Proteus bacteremia, and that um, these were acceptable um, high rates of empiric therapy being effective. I do want to um, mention, though, that it was ultimately always at the physician's discretion if they wanted to modify antibiotics or not. The pharmacist just notified the physician of the results and let them know the drug of choice. If they had a patient that was not responding appropriately or perhaps um, had some other issues going on or was just looking very clinically sick, um, we didn't have recommendations accepted 100% of the time for those scenarios. 
And it is um, demonstrated by our data of um, ICU patients that had higher anti-pseudomonal utilization compared to the overall population. And it is likely that our ICU patients who were sicker did have more combination therapy or received broader spectrum antibiotics for a longer period of time because of the acuity of their illness. But overall, it was at the physician's discretion to choose to accept the empiric antibiotic recommendations. So to conclude, we found Veraging BCGN implemented with our antibiotic stewardship intervention at Scripps to improve the time to effective antibiotic therapy for our multidrug resistant organisms. And for our, multi, for our organisms that were found not to be MDROs, we demonstrated the ability to reduce broad spectrum antibiotic use when it wasn't needed and also to lower our antibiotic costs. To finish up, I just wanted to offer a couple implementation tips that I've learned with our experience over the past couple of years implementing Veragene at our Scripps system. And as, as Kim mentioned, the most bang for your buck is going to be real-time notification and intervention by an antibiotic stewardship team. And I, I hope I've demonstrated here by our um, smaller hospitals that it doesn't have to be somebody there 24-7 um, monitoring this to have an impact. Um, it doesn't also have to be somebody that's an ID specialist. In our situation, we trained all of our clinical pharmacists to be able to interpret the results and make recommendations. And that way, since we did have an overnight pharmacist who was here 24-7, um, there's always somebody there that can follow up on results when we had um, a CTXM in the middle of the night where the patient was on ineffective antibiotics. I would recommend choosing someone, however, that can take verbal medication orders because it is convenient when you're notifying the physician of the result to be able at the same time to put in the order to change the antibiotics if needed. And I do recommend having somebody accountable to oversee the program and make sure that everybody is doing what they're supposed to be doing. I have found in my experience too, when we get a little lax on that, when somebody isn't um, closely monitoring this, that sometimes we do tend to miss patients. So I, I do recommend having somebody overall be accountable. And then also when you're thinking about implementing, think about your physician accountability. What are the expectations for the physician's actions based on results? Um, if needed, do an audit and feedback of the actions to assess if physicians are doing the correct actions or not. And I also found that when we did have physicians that were resistant to accept recommendations, that getting our ID physicians involved and having the physician peer-to-peer -peer conversation really helped as well. And then set your expectations to be realistic. Not 100% of the interventions are going to be accepted, and it should be um, known up front that that would be probably an unreasonable expectation. The most challenging part I found with our Veragene implementation has been communication. And this can be communication between lab to pharmacy or from pharmacy to the physicians. From lab to pharmacy, um, you know, there's several different methods to explore. We tried the phone call initially, which wasn't successful. We then switched to email, which was successful. And then our system just finally finished our go live on our new EMR. And we're using now our EMR in basket to automatically deliver the results to the pharmacist. And the lab technicians do not even have to do any sort of work anymore to get those results automatically sent to the pharmacist. From the pharmacy to the physician, uh, it's important to get feedback from your physicians. I've found that the physicians really want to know this information. They want to know when the organism has been identified that's causing the patient um, their infection and find out what's convenient for them, um, whether that be paging. And if it is a text page, we do that frequently here. One tip I provide is don't give out the result if you want the physician to call them back. So I will typically just say, I have the Veragene result for your patient in 709 please call me back. Um, and then texting is another favorite here at Scripps. This can be a very convenient way to communicate for both pharmacists and physicians and our regular physicians um, that we see on a daily basis. We're pretty comfortable communicating with them this way. And for our pharmacists that round on a regular basis with these teams, they're all also in contact with these physicians on a regular basis. Um, the be careful with HIPAA violations is my only caution with um, texting. And then rounds, um, this can be very helpful for overnight results that we follow up on first thing in the morning. And that concludes the webinar for today. Um, thank you for listening, and we'll be happy at this point to take any questions.
Thanks. Thank you both very much for that insightful presentation. Uh, as you said, we'll now get started with our Q&A portion of this webinar. Just a reminder to all of our attendees today that they can send in any questions they might have using that questions chat box. Uh, I have received a few, so I'm going to go ahead and get started with those. Our first question here, uh, how often should you update the antibiotic guideline per 100 infected patients for the antibiotic of choice before the varigine test is used? Uh, ergo, as the data changes, when do you start changing the drug of choice? I can start with what we did at Scripps. Um, we collect our data on a yearly basis. And we actually just completed doing this last month. So we actually track every single varigine result and examine the antibiotic susceptibilities. And on an annual basis, we reaffirm or change our empiric recommendations. Um, so this is the second time we've done that. And the only change we had to make was a miter modification in our pseudomonas sensitivities because we had some changes between our piptazo, cefepime, and septazidine sensitivities. Um, but other than that, we um, still retained our high susceptibilities for our empiric therapy recommendations. And uh, I second what Maggie just said. We usually do it. We haven't been doing it for as long as they have, but about once a year, especially once your new antibiograms come out for your facility. And then we are in the process of actually looking at our Varagene data for the next year. So I think yearly is appropriate. Great, thank you both very much for uh, for weighing in on that question. Um, our next question here, this came in during uh, your part of the talk, Kim. Uh, what breakpoints were used for the PIP-TAZO for susceptibility? Oh, um, so we have the, oh, okay, I see what they're saying. Uh, MICs of less than or equal to four, I do believe. I'd have to go back and look. Our cefepine ones are the UCAST, but we use CLSI for PIP-TAZO. Okay, good to know. Thanks for weighing in on that one. Our next audience question, how often is your ID consult service actively following patients with gram-negative bloodstream infections? Um, do they often get consulted after the Varagene BCGN results come back? So for- start with Oh, go ahead. Oh, the awkwardness of webinars. <laughs> I, I, can, um, I can start. Um, our ID physicians, when we have a resistance marker that's detected, are involved 100% of the time because we do not, we um, only allow the first dose of the restricted antibiotic to be dispensed and then an ID consult has to be obtained. So they are involved on all patients that have a resistance marker detected. And then for our organisms that are non-MDRO, most ID physicians are involved in the Pseudomonas and Acinetobacter cases. And then for the enteric cases, generally it's at the discretion of the hospitalist or intensivist. Um, but for uncomplicated bacteremias, ID is not necessarily always involved. If there is a complicating issue, then they will consult ID for help with management of those infections. So at University of Maryland, like I said, we are a bit unique in that we have so many ID consult services. When we look back at our data, we found that over 80% were already being followed by ID at the time that the Varagene result came back. Um, I think it's it depends on your facility. I know that they've discussed having mandatory ID consults for gram-negative bacteremia, but it was never actually approved. So it kind of depends on your facility whether or not um, they'd already be following or would potentially automatically be followed based on just the presence of gram-negative bacteremia or if it would be more based on the clinical symptoms and situation where it might be a more complicated case, they'll get ID on board. Okay, great. Thanks for those responses. Our next question, how comfortable are you with recommending de-escalation before final susceptibilities return? Uh, for instance, use of uh, trazoxone uh, when an E. coli is CTXM negative. Uh, and how often are these recommendations accepted? Kim, perhaps uh, you want uh, to speak to this one first. Yeah, so we did an extensive validation with our own organisms and our own varaging data to show that we would very unlikely miss a phenotypic ceftriaxone resistance in a CTXM negative E. coli. 
So we've presented that data to our subcommittee and our ID physicians pretty frequently. So if it's a patient who is not immunocompromised, not in the ICU, especially those that have a simple case of like genital urinary source with E. coli, a med, a med uh, floor patient, we do recommend de-escalating deceptriaxone, and we have been fairly successful with those recommendations. Like I said, we review every patient who has a gram-negative bloodstream infection at least once a day. If something like that comes back from a patient who is in our comprehensive cancer center or on one of the transplant floors, we don't usually touch it and wait till susceptibilities. But if it's a less complicated patient, we usually do recommend it, and we have been pretty successful in actually getting it de-escalated. I echo pretty much everything Kim said as well. 1% um, of our E. coli was found to not be susceptible to ceftriaxone in that situation, um, so that's extremely low. And it's um, generally the more complicated patients that you would maybe have some hesitancy on de-escalating, but for the most part, we are comfortable recommending de-escalation in the majority of our patients. And I would say the important thing for uh, different institutions is to really validate that presence or absence of CTXM, how often do you still see or not see phenotypic resistance? Because theoretically, we when we went into this process, we were we did not expect to have that much CTXM, so we were surprised that the majority of our ceftriaxone resistant isolates were actually CTXM. So it's important to do an institution-specific look at your data uh, before making any recommendations. Okay, perfect. Thanks for those answers. Um, our next question, how was the laboratory clinical consultant involved with the team? Uh, Maggie, maybe you want to start off with this one. Um, yeah, we were very involved with our um, laboratory um, uh, directors. It was actually a lot of fun from my standpoint working in the pharmacy to get to know some of my colleagues outside of the pharmacy. And um, we were involved with our laboratory director and our laboratory, um, one of the supervisors who helped train. And um, we were in contact back and, back and forth constantly, especially while we were trying to work out some of our communication bugs. And so it was a very collaborative effort with our uh, microbiology staff. And uh, you know, one one thing else I learned out of this experience too is that for laboratory that doesn't really um, get any of the return on investment, it really is important to partner together. So where in pharmacy you can see a return on investment by saving your pharmacy costs. Um, so it's, I think it's important to partner together to realize, although one department doesn't see any um, net benefit from it, um, it can be made up overall by the, the global improvement in cost of care. And Kim, anything to add there with that question? No, I think that was, no, I've got nothing else to add, thank you. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you both very much. For all of those answers, we have now reached the end of the question and answer portion of this webinar. If you have further questions, please direct them to the email address now showing on your screen. So that's njusenko at luminexcorp.com. And I'd like to thank everyone for participating in today's conference. You'll be receiving a follow-up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. And uh, you can go ahead and share this webinar on LinkedIn by clicking the link I've sent to all participants through that questions chat box. A survey window will also be popping up on your screen momentarily and your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. Now, please join us in thanking our speakers for today, Dr. Maggie Box and Dr. Kimberly Clays. We hope you found this conference informative. Have a great day, everyone.